Hey, good morning. Welcome to church, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good. You guys look great. Do me a favor. Look at the person next to you. Look them deep in their eyes and tell them you look better than you looked last week. <laughs> my name is, uh, my name is Baron. Um, I am one of the pastors here at Journey. Uh, it's so awesome to be with you guys. I am, um, it's not lost on me the privilege that it is to be able to be on this stage on a Sunday and, and share this stage with you know, people like Scotty and other great communicators. So I'm really grateful to be able to share this message with you guys this morning and just happy to be a part of such an amazing, amazing church. Uh, I wanna go ahead and welcome our Highlands Ranch location uh, watching with us today. Can we give Highlands Ranch a big applause? And uh, also everybody else watching online with us. We're so happy that they're with us. Now, if you're new with us today, you got a connect card uh, as you came in. There's a little tear off at the bottom of that. We'd like to invite you to fill in as much information as you feel comfortable with, and when the offering bucket comes past at the end of the service, you're welcome to just throw that in there. And then uh, last announcement for today is baptism. Next Sunday, we are creating an opportunity for people to take their next step with Jesus and to get baptized. And so if you're interested in baptism, you want more information or you'd like to sign up, go to our website, you'll find a sign up link right there. So let's close our eyes and we're gonna pray together as we open this service. Lord, we thank you for the fact that we can be here this morning. We thank you for breath in our lungs. We thank you for bodies that work. We thank you for the gift of life. And we're so, so grateful that you're with us, that we can be here with our friends, family, loved ones, neighbors. We honor you for that. And Lord, we just wanna pray this prayer as we do every single Sunday when we gather together at Journey. And I'd like to invite you to pray this prayer with me. It's as simple as this. Lord, would you speak to me today? Because I'm listening. And would you go ahead and pray that prayer for someone else sitting maybe to your left or to your right or someone that you invited to church today? Would you pray that God would speak to them and that their heart would be open to hear? We honor you, Lord. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you've been uh, coming to church for the last uh, few weeks, you'll know we're at the tail end, and I think today is the final installment of a series called Traps. Uh, we've talked about a whole bunch of different traps that, that we often find ourselves in. And the basis for, for this whole idea is based in two scriptures. One is John 10 verse 10 that says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. God wants to give us a full life. Now, a full life is not necessarily an easy life. A full life is not necessarily a, a life where everything goes, is, is plain sailing and, 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 and smooth, but it's a full life. It's a life of God's blessing and provision. And the next scripture is Galatians 5 verse 1. It says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And that's what we find ourselves often doing is that Jesus came to set us free, but we often go and set ourselves back into slavery by falling into these traps, falling into the traps that we've mentioned. And, and, and we find ourselves in those things so easily. Now, when I was uh, 28, I traveled to New Zealand uh, to visit my family. Uh, my mom and my sister and her kids live and her husband live in a small town in the South Island called Timaru, beautiful little town. So I bought the cheapest ticket I could find on Emirates Airline because I had zero money. And it was so cheap that I was in the back of the plane with the goats and the chickens. <laughs> and uh, because the ticket was so cheap, this was my route. I flew, if you know anything about geography, I flew Johannesburg to Dubai, Dubai to Bangkok, Bangkok to Sydney, Sydney to Christchurch, and then drove two hours to Timaru. 36 hours in the air, not, not total traveling time, 36 hours in the air. Um, I arrived in New Zealand and we spent a week uh, in, in that area before we then decided to go to Tikapo, beautiful place, beautiful ski resort. Long story short, I had a ski accident, which seems like it's kind of a thing with the pastors here at Journey. Like you're not really <laughs> a pastor at Journey unless you've injured yourself on a ski slope. And I ruptured the L4 and L5 discs in my back. So I had serious sciatica. It felt like somebody was jamming like a hot poker into, the, into my back over here and I couldn't walk and I had to extend my trip for another week. But the good thing was that my travel insurance ended up uh, upgrading my ticket from economy to business class on Emirates, which ended up being the entire 36 hour flying route back again on Emirates in business class because I had to lie, lay, I had to lay down because my back was so sore. And I'm telling you, it was amazing. It was, a, <laughs> it was the best, most painful thing I'd ever experienced in my life. 
Because what happens is, you know, you, 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 you get on the plane before everyone else, right? Which is awesome. Um, you walk past everyone like, hey guys, see you later. You're in economy. I'm in business class. You flash a ticket when you walk past them, you know? It's, uh, it's pretty fun. <clears throat> when you get on the plane, there's a robe. There's a pair of slippers on your seat. It's incredible. The, the flight attendant knows your name. She's like, hey, Mr. Fury, would you like some champagne or orange juice? I said, girlfriend, I'll take both. <laughs> I don't even like champagne. It was like 7 a.m. I didn't even drink the champagne. I just wanted it to sit there, you know, so I can feel what it feels like to be rich. And so eventually they bring you a hot towel, you know, and I'm like, I get this hot towel, and I'm like, I don't know what to do with this hot towel. And so I wait to see what the other people are doing. Fortunately, I waited because they wiped their faces with it. Um, and so they bring you a little toiletry kit, like this beautiful little toiletry kit. Uh, it has perfume in it, B Bulgari men's perfume that you can actually take home with you. It's amazing. It, I mean, it's, I couldn't even afford the, the, the perfume, never mind the first class or the business class ticket. And uh, the bathrooms are great. They have like, they have extra space. They're big and they have like a, a rack with men's perfume and women's perfume that you can use and do whatever you want. And when they bring you food, it's not like the little packaged meals that you get in economy. It's like, it looks like a five-star restaurant kind of thing. I don't know where the chef is hiding on the plane, but somehow they had a chef on the plane and he made this amazing food. They give you metal cutlery, not plastic, metal on a plane. It's crazy. I don't know what, how that works. And so the seat reclines all the way. And I think, you know, at a stage I was like, this is, this, this is the way to do this. You know, this flying, if I can do this, flying is going to be really, really cool. And then at every destination you stop at, because you're in business class, you have access to the business class lounge. And because I flew that route back, those five different stops, I had access to every single business class lounge. And the great thing about the business class lounge is that they've got amazing food and they've got showers. So I took like five showers on this trip, you know, <laughs> just because I wanted to see all the showers. I was washing myself with the rich people soap. It was amazing. It was great. It was the best flight experience I've ever had until the next time I had to fly. The next time I had to fly, I flew internationally. I was with my wife. Uh, we went on our honeymoon. We also flew Emirates. And uh, we got on the plane. And you know what happens? You get to that point in the plane where they say, rich people to the left, poor people to the right. <laughs> Follow the chickens. You'll get to the back of the plane. And uh, they let those people on first. And um, I remember saying to my wife, but I don't want to sit in economy class. I don't want to sit with the peasants. I want to sit with my people in business class. <laughs> These people smell like beef and cheese. They smell funny. I don't want to sit with them. And can you believe that I'm sitting on a plane, I'm headed to Thailand for, vacation, for, for honeymoon with my beautiful wife, we're going to have an amazing time, and all I can think about is how upset I am that I'm not in business class. I'm sitting there sulking like a little baby. You know what you call that? You call it entitlement. It's called Entitlement. It's the belief or feeling that one is inherently deserving of special treatments or privileges. Today we're talking about the trap of entitlement. And I want to ask you this question. Did any of you ever have to teach your kids to be entitled? Anyone? No one, right? That's what I thought. Like, no one ever said to their little, to their little kid, the little five-year-old, hey, you need to throw a bigger tantrum when you don't get what you want because that's good. Like, no one ever said that, right? It comes naturally. Parents actually have the responsibility to teach the opposite. We have to kind of get entitlement out of our kids so we can make them good, healthy, well-adjusted human beings that other people like to be around. And so entitlement has been a part of the human race since the Garden of Eden. Kids are born with this innate nature to be selfish and to focus on themselves and to think that the world owes them something. You may not feel entitled as you're sitting here this morning, but I think every single one of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll be able to do some kind of introspection and realize that in, in some aspects of our life, maybe not in all aspects, but in certain areas of our lives, we feel like we're entitled to certain things. And you see, that's the thing about entitlement. Entitlement is a very, very, very subtle trap, but it's still a trap. It's hard to identify because we work hard, so we feel deserving, right? That we feel like I put the time in, I put the effort in, so I am, I am uh, entitled to the results. We often feel that we're owed something, and the truth is that entitlement is not something that only uh, afflicts the wealthy. I've met poor people who are entitled and rich people who are not. The opposite is also true. I've met rich people who are entitled and poor people who are not. I think entitlement is something that we all wrestle with at some point in our lives. I know I wrestle with it and have wrestled with it and sometimes still wrestle with it. And here are a few questions to help you self-diagnose 
if you uh, feel a little bit of entitlement. Now, don't answer these questions for your spouse or the person next to you. Answer them for yourself, right? Don't bump anyone in the, show, in the, in the ribs. I don't want to cause a fight. Do you often feel discontent? Do you have a, a feeling of, man, I'm not happy. I think things could be better. Do I feel envy or resentment over the blessings others seem to have? Oh, their kid got into Princeton. Yay for them. Am I disappointed with life? Do I doubt God's faithful provision for me? Do I feel like certain rules don't apply to me? Now, if you answered yes to any or maybe all of these questions, then like me, you probably have a problem with entitlement. So why is entitlement bad? Why is it a negative thing? Why does it affect us negatively? Very simply, the first reason is because it leads to a sense of disappointment. It leads to a sense of disappointment. I have a friend in South Africa. Uh, his name is Martin. He's a farmer, very, very successful guy. Started off with nothing, worked himself, worked, worked his fingers to the bone, and eventually got enough money to buy his own farm, and he just kept growing and growing and growing and growing and was doing really well at a stage. Until his wife got cancer, a hailstorm destroyed his entire crop, and his house burnt down in the same year. A squirrel chewed an electrical cable, got electrocuted, and set fire to the house. And I remember speaking, sitting with him, and him telling me like, the emotions that he's going through and the experience that he's had with all of this trauma and all of these difficult things in his life. And I remember him saying to me how disappointed he feels in God, how he feels like God is against him, like God is punishing him, like God is treating him and his family unfairly. And I remember sitting in that emotion with him and honestly not having an answer for him not having a smart theological rebuttal to his situation and, and not being able to really comfort him because honestly, I looked at his situation, and I thought, man, this is a pretty raw deal. A few months later, we had another conversation. And in this conversation, when we started the conversation, I could see that his entire demeanor was different. Like his whole, it, it looked like he'd gone through a transformation. And I asked him, you know, what's going on? What's, what's different about you? And he said, he said, well, my wife is still sick. She battled cancer for a long time and she's actually in remission now, which is really awesome. He said, my, my wife is still sick, my house is still burnt down, and my crops are still destroyed. But I stopped asking God, why me? And I started asking God, why not me? Why not me? What makes me better than the guy next to me or, or, or the other guy that the same kind of things happen to? See, I think entitlement makes us believe that, that God owes me something. That he's got to deliver. He's got to do something for me. That, and that because we follow, we, we, we think because we follow Jesus, we're, we're entitled to some kind of special treatment. We're entitled to, to everything always going well and having, having an easy life and, and, and that, that our faith would just be a walk in the park. The problem is if someone told you it's a walk in the park, they lied to you. It's Jurassic Park, you know? <laughs> and so Jesus never said that life would be easy. He never said that. But he did say that even though life will get tough, I'll be with you. I will be alongside you. I will be inside you. I will guide you. I will provide. I will help you during the good and the bad seasons of life. And so the problem with entitlement is that it makes us believe things about God that's not true of God. It makes us believe things of, of God that are not true of God. The truth is that God never stops being good. We just stop being grateful. God never stops being good. He has always been good. He will always be good. It is in his nature. It is who he is. But oftentimes I find myself not being grateful. The second thing it does is it breeds perpetual frustration. Entitled people always have a very high expectation of the people around them and can be very demanding and they want what they want when they want it how they want it. I believe Americans call these people Karens. Middle-aged white ladies that are always looking for a fight, <laughs> ready to roll. And I feel bad for the Karens because I have a friend named Karen, and she's amazing. She's the furthest thing from a Karen you could ever, ever imagine. But these high expectations and demands lead to frustration. It, it leads to frustration because the fact is that people in our lives, our friends, our family members, our spouse, our, our colleagues, all of these people, well, they have one thing in common. They're people. 
And people make mistakes. People fall short. People sin. People get it wrong. And so entitlement causes chaos in relationships because we expect something from people. And oftentimes when they don't deliver, we're upset. We're upset because we feel like we've been wronged, because we feel a certain entitlement to a certain kind of treatment, and we think that our spouse, and we have these grand expectations of what our spouse should be doing for us, how they should be serving us, how they should be supporting us, how they should be loving us, how they should be doing for us. And so what entitlement does is it focuses on me. It focuses my attention on on me and what I want and what I need and what I think I deserve and what I want to get right now because I want it. And it puts me at the center of my universe. And and the frustration comes from me not getting what I think I'm owed. And so I live with this sense of perpetual frustration of feeling, uh, why, why can't everybody just give me what I want? Why do, I always, why do I always get a raw deal? And you get people that end up living in this mindset of it's always, everyone's always against me. Everyone's always, I, I'm always the one pulling the short straw. There's an interesting book by uh, the author Adam Grant. He, he wrote a book called uh, Give and Take. And in this book, he talks about three different kinds of people. He, he calls them givers, takers, and matchers. And so basically what they did is they did a study in the workplace over a few decades, and they they classified people in these different categories, and they watched their trajectory uh, over the course of, I think, two decades in the workplace. And so givers are the kind of people that are always giving sacrificially. They're the kind of people that love. They're the kind of people that care. They're the kind of people that will always go the extra mile. They'll show up early. They'll stay late. We all love those kinds of people. Takers are the kind of people that will always look for what they can get out of any given situation. They will always look, what can I benefit? If it doesn't benefit me, then I'm not interested. It's about me, and it has to make me happy and comfortable. And then matches are interesting people. What matches do is they say, to the degree that you give, I will give. To the degree that you do not give, to that degree I will not give. They're the ones that like to police the takers. They're the ones that say, hey, if you're going to take, I'm going to take. If you're going to give, I'm going to give. The interesting thing about this book and about the study is that over that trajectory of two decades, they found that by far the people who were the most happy, successful, and content in their relationships and at the workplace were the givers. Everybody thinks that the takers, the people who step on each other in this dog-eat-dog kind of world are going to be the ones that are going to come out on top. But at the end of the day, it's it's the givers. It's the givers. By far, the givers are the most successful. The third thing that entitlement does is it creates an attitude of ungratefulness. An attitude of ungratefulness. I have a friend. uh, He's from Tanzania. You guys call it Tanzania, but you're wrong. Uh, (laughs) It's like the difference between water and water. <laughs> whenever, whenever I go to a Starbucks or whatever and ask for a water, the girl goes, what did you say? Like, water. <laughs> so, just kidding. Uh, and so he, he fled Tanzania because there was Muslim extremists that were persecuting him and his family. They were trying to kill him uh, because he started a Christian radio station and he started a Bible college for pastors in that area. And after a few months in the U.S., someone asked him, what's the biggest difference between Tanzania and the U.S.? What's the most stark contrast between the two countries? And he looked, he looked at them and he thought for a while and he said, well, you know, the biggest difference is that you guys in America, you use clean water to flush your toilets. Just let that sink in for a bit. You use clean water to flush your toilets. 448 million people around the world don't have access to clean drinking water on a daily basis. We flush our toilets with it. That's more than the entire population of the United States, 448 million people. But man, I can get upset when they get my Starbucks order wrong. Two espressos instead of four. What am I, an animal? What is going on? The problem with being comfortable and having nice things is not the nice things themselves. It's the fact that we get so accustomed to them that we take them for granted. When was the last time you opened the tap in your house or the faucet and water came out and you said, thank God that water came out? When was the last time you flicked a switch in your house and the lights came on and you said, thank God for electricity? It's things that we live with every day that we don't even think about. We, don't, if we, we, don't, we give it zero thought. I, don't, I never wake up going, please, Lord, let the water work in my house. Never. And so here's the thing. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm not trying to shame you. I'm not trying to, you know, 
do that cliche thing. Where, oh, look how good we have it. Look how bad other people have it. We're so terrible, all that kind of stuff. All of us in this room and everyone watching online and everyone at Highlands Ranch, enjoy the privileges of living in a first world country. We, we have a roof over our head. We have clothes to wear. We have a car to drive in. We have a, a house to sleep in. We have a, a, a phone. We have a job. We have family. We have all these beautiful things. Many people in this room have worked hard and saved and invested and done really well financially. And you, so you may be thinking, well, I worked for everything I have. I started with nothing. I, I put in the time. I worked and worked and worked. I should be able to enjoy it. Or my parents gave me some money and I should be able to enjoy it. Or I went to college and I worked really hard and I should be able to enjoy the fruits of my labor. And you know what? You're right. You're right. You should be. God has blessed you. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the blessing and the grace of God on your life. You didn't choose to be born in this country. You didn't choose to be born into this situation that you're born into. It is the blessing and the grace of God on your life. Because you see, the issue is not the things we own. The, thing, the issue is not the things we have. The issue is what we do with what we have. It's our attitude towards what we have and what we don't have that matters. It's the orientation of our heart towards the blessings of God in our life. It's the orientation of, our, of ourselves in the, in the midst of, of, of the rest of this world and, and everything that's happening and, and where we see ourselves in God's bigger plan that's important. See, the trap of entitlement is a heart issue. It's a heart issue. It's about, it's about my orientation, the orientation of my heart towards the blessings God has given me. And so the best example of this idea can be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. And, and this is John's account of the Last Supper. You've probably read it before, but in John 13, verse 2, it starts with this. It says, the evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. So you know the story. Judas is betraying Jesus. Uh, it's already in motion. All of this is about to happen. And then John goes on and he tells us this in verse three. He says these two words right on the front end of the sentence. He says, Jesus knew. Now I think those are two really important words because I think through those words, John is trying to convey something to us of a realization that Jesus had in that moment. The rest of that scripture says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. It's as if John is telling us that in some new way, it, it kind of dawned on him. It kind of, this realization took place as he sat in this room with this group of disciples and, and this one that is about to, to betray him. It dawned on him and it hung on over him that the Father had put all things, all things. You know what the Greek for all things are? Is? Or is? I don't know which one it is. Is all things. Like all things means all things, all authority in heaven and earth, every single bit of power, every single bit of, of, of everything he put, placed under the authority of Jesus because he was fully God and fully man at that moment in the, around that table with those guys. I think the realization that he had was not only that was he the most powerful person in the room, but he was the most powerful person in the city. Not only was he the most powerful person in the city, but he was the most powerful person in the nation. Not only the nation, but he was also the most powerful person in the world. By the, by the snap of his fingers, he could deliver the same amount of power that a nuclear weapon can deliver. He had all the power in the world. So what do you do? What do you do when it dawns on you that, that God has given you all of this power? And right down the street, there's a group of people who are conspiring to murder and execute you on a cross. In fact, the cross is already picked out. What, what do you do when it dawns on you that you're the most powerful person in the room, city, country, planet, and you know that the man who is going to betray you was sitting across from you right now? In fact, he's probably slipped out the back. He's probably on his way down the road to go and betray you for 30 pieces of silver. What do you do when you realize that you've been entitled by God with all the power that has ever existed and ever will exist in the world? Look at what Jesus does next. John 13, verse four. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing. And so the context of that, you have to understand he was a rabbi. And so a rabbi wore a robe that was a symbol of his authority. It made him stand out from the crowd. So he had his disciples, they'd look the same. And the robe, the, the rab rabbinical robe would set him apart. People would see as they approached him or as he came into a city that he was different to the rest of the people that was with him. And so Jesus stands up from the meal and, and all eyes go to him. Because what is he doing? He takes off his robe, and then what he did next, I'm sure there was not a word spoken. I'm sure it was dead, dead silent. Verse four carries on. He says, so he got up from the meal, 
took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. At that moment, there was many different emotions in that room. I'm sure they, they realized what he was about to do because this was customary in the Jewish culture. He'd gone from rabbi to servant simply by taking a robe off and tying the towel around his waist. And so guess what our Savior, guess what Jesus does the moment that he's aware that he had been entitled by God to all the power, all the authority, and everything in this world. Guess what he does? He takes on the form of a servant. He becomes a servant. He becomes a servant. Take a look at this. John 13, verse 5 to 6 says, After that, he poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? In other words, he's saying, seriously, are you going to wash my feet? I saw you use those hands and make, make, mix some mud uh, on the ground and put it in someone's eyes and, and, and they began to see. I saw you lay those hands on people and, and they were sick and suddenly they were healed. I saw you lay those hands on a lady that we were friends with and she was dead and then she came to life and then she served us a meal. You're gonna use those hands to wash my feet? The God of the universe? Verse seven goes on, he says, Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later, later you will understand. In other words, men, you think I'm simply doing what you, don't, what you didn't hire someone else to do. You simply think I'm doing what you actually should be doing. You should be washing feet. You think I'm simply doing what's customary, but what I'm doing is way bigger than what you could ever imagine or think. John 13, 12 carries on. He says, when he had finished washing their feet, and this is super powerful, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. So in, in this moment, there's this visual. There's this Jesus the rabbi takes off his, his robe. Jesus the teacher, Jesus the, the authority figure takes off his robe and replaces it with a garb of a servant. Washes their feet, removes the garb of a servant, replaces his rabbinical robe. And there I'm telling you in this silent room, with, with disciples' mouths hanging op open, nobody's saying a word, he asks this question. He says, do you understand what I have done for you? Do you understand? And Jesus asks this question despite the fact that he's been around the disciples long enough to know that they don't understand a lot. <laughs> like these guys, they were slow. And so verse 12 carries on and says, do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. He's saying, you call me teacher and Lord. I'm entitled to those positions. You call me teacher, it's 100% correct. I am your teacher. I am the one who teaches you. You call me Lord, that is 100% correct. You should call me Lord. Those are the titles I deserve. God has bestowed them upon me. That is who I am. Then in John 13 verse three, he says, and rightfully so, or rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So under your seats right now, you'll see a basin and a towel. I'm just kidding. We're not going to wash each other's feet. <laughs> We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. I promise you. That'll be weird. I've set for you an example at any time, any moment, any place, any time when it dawns on you that you're entitled. I've set for you an example if you ever wonder what you should do with this entitlement of time, of, of money, of influence, of power, of possession, if you ever wonder, what am I entitled to and what should I do with what I'm entitled to? Verse 15 is the answer. He says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. You should do as I have done for you. Now, this is not very complicated. Jesus is trying to, he's trying to help us reorientate our attitude towards what we've been blessed with. He's trying to help us understand why we have been blessed with those things. Jesus says, I've set for you an example. I went beyond teaching. I set the example. I want you to look for a way to leverage what you have for the sake of those who have less than you have. I want you to look for a way to take what God has blessed you with and what God has given to you, whether that's time, whether that's treasure, whether that's talent, and I want you to use that not for self-gratification and, and only your enjoyment, but for the blessing and the benefit of those around you in the world. 
I've set you this example, as I have done for you, so you go and do. That should be the reputation of the church in every community in the world. It should be the reputation of the church. When people think of the church, they should, they should think, I don't believe what they believe, but I'm sure glad they're in this community. I don't necessarily buy into all the Jesus stuff, but I hope my daughter marries one. I hope my son marries one. I don't really do the whole church thing, but I like to hire these people because they're great workers. I like to work for these kind of people because they're incredible, incredible employers. I don't necessarily embrace all the theology, but I'm telling you what, I tell you what, the more you give to these Christian people, the better the environment around them gets because they give and give and give. And so he goes on in John, 3, 6, uh, John 13, verse 16. He says, very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their masters, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you not write a book about them, not make a Facebook post about them, not build a theology around them, not build a church around them, not any of those things. You'll be blessed if you do them. If you do them. If you ask the question, what should I do with what I've been entitled to? Jesus would say, go and use that for the benefit of others, not for yourself. The world will be blessed if we do that. And the road to recovery begins when we leverage our entitlements for the benefits of those that are less entitled. Imagine how the world would change. Imagine how the discussion in our nation would change. If the more entitled you were, the more apt you were at helping those who are less privileged than you. If that was the default. Instead of saying, I'm entitled, give it to me. I want what I want when I want it, the way I want it. We took on the, the servant's robe wrapped a towel around our waist and said, how can I make a difference? How can I influence this world for the better, my family for the better, my workplace for the better, my colleagues' lives for the better? How can I make this world a better place through what God has blessed me with? And so this is the trap of entitlement. The question is, what is the way out? And so I wanna give you some escape strategies for the trap of entitlement. The first one, uh, as we wrap up today, is serve others. Service to others is powerful because it's one of the most practical ways that we reorientate our own hearts. It's, the, it's a practical way for us to say, hey, my needs are not as, as important. I am not the most important person in the world. I am not the center of the universe. I am going to take the opportunity to serve others. Not because of what I can get from it, but because God has called me to give and to serve. Serving is an attitude. It's a posture. It's a, it's a pre-decision. It's a, it's a thing I do. I, I, I serve at church. I decide I'm coming. I, I tell them I'm going to be at, here at 8 o'clock. I show up before 8. I serve. I give. And many of you already do this at church. We have the most incredible serve team members in this church. We have people doing kids ministry and middle school ministry and high school ministry and host teams and group leaders and, and, and ushers and all kinds of people. People doing parking, making sure that there's no fist fights in the parking lot. Um, we have so many amazing serve team members. And they live this out. <clears throat> and so I want to tell you a story about my friend Bob. Bob uh, is a serve team member. He serves down in our kids' ministry. Him and his wife, Cindy, they serve in our nursery. And so a couple of weeks ago, there was this little girl. Her and her family were new to, to Journey, actually new from California. And obviously, I'm not going to you know, divulge their identity for, for safety, security, and privacy reasons. But Bob gave me permission to share this story. Um, so she, she was new and she was very, very, very upset. She was crying. Uh, she was away from her parents because obviously the parents came upstairs to do church. And so she screamed from the start of the service till the end of the service nonstop. The parents decided they were going to give it one more try. They're going to come the next week to church. And if it happens again, they're not going to come back to journey or they're not going to come back to church again. And so the same thing happened the second week. My wife was actually holding this little girl. She was screaming. She was losing it. And uh, in came Bob. And the little girl looked at Bob and went, Dada, and reached out her arms to him and just grabbed hold of Bob and just embraced him and stopped crying. And Bob was like, is it okay? Can I take her? My wife was like, take her. You're the man. <laughs> you know, you take her. And so that whole hour, Bob just walked around with her and showed her different things. And she was very, very, very comfortable and very peaceful. End of the service, parents come downstairs, they meet Bob, they share stories, they share information. They fi Bob finds out that they're new to, to, from California, they don't have family, the wife is pregnant. They share information, they say, hey, we can, we'll, we'd love to help you, to babysit, all those kinds of things. And uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the, the exchange, everyone's in tears. Bob turns around 
he's in tears. My wife sees he's in tears and she says, Bob, what's going on with you? Why are you crying? And Bob says, you know, Moshe, my wife and I can't have kids. And God told us when we started serving in, in Journey Kids that this would be the way that he's going to give us kids. The kids that we serve are going to be the kids that he gives us. And that little girl started healing something in my heart today. And I'm just so grateful. And so this is the thing about serving others is that we often approach serving others. We think, hey, I'm gonna make a huge difference. I'm gonna do this for someone. And that's, that's the way it should be. It should never be laden with expectation of what I'm gonna get. But 99% of the time when we serve others, God serves us. He does something in our heart. He brings healing to a couple who struggles with infertility. Isn't that something that's so beautiful about God? The same thing happens on mission trips. You know, we think we're going to go make a big difference. And it, and it does make a difference. But often the difference is in, made in the lives of the people who come back from that mission trip where they have perspective and they see and they're, they're grateful for, for, for everything they have. I want to ask you this question. When was the last time you served someone that couldn't serve you back? When was the last time you went out of your way to give and to do something for someone that could not return the favor? When is the last time you served someone knowing that you would benefit in no way, shape, or form from that service? Second thing that we can do to get out of the trap of entitlement is to live sacrificially. Jesus said we need to take up our cross daily. Matthew 16, 24 said, uh, says this, says, then Jesus says to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you take up your life for my sake, if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. You see, the kingdom of God is opposite to the kingdom of the world. The kingdom of the world says, get as much as you can, when you can, and, and just it's dog eat dog, and you've got to do and gather as much as you can for yourself. The kingdom of God is the opposite. He says, if you want to be the, the most important in the kingdom, you have to be the least in the kingdom. If you want to be the best, you have to be able to be the least. If you want to be rich, you have to be able to be poor. If you want to have life, you have to give your life away. See, the truth is you cannot be an entitled disciple. There's no such thing. <clears throat> That's an oxymoron. It's like jumbo shrimp or working vacation or seriously funny or honest politician. Those are just some of my favorite <laughs> oxymorons. The gospel of Jesus demands that we give our lives instead of trying to keep them. The gospel requires that we deny ourselves, and that we die daily to our sinful and selfish, prideful ways. Jesus did not call us to a life of comfort. He called us to a life of meaning. And the problem is that we are so focused on comfort that we miss the meaning. And then we wonder why people are depressed and angry and lonely and, and all of these things. Because it's actually not supposed to be about us. It's supposed to be about others. See, salvation is the free gift of God and cannot be earned. You can't do anything to make God love you more. He loves you. But discipleship comes at a price. To be a follower of Jesus comes at a price. Following Jesus means giving up my old sinful nature and following Jesus, taking up my cross. I wanna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a moment as we do some introspection and as you have an opportunity to speak to God in your own words, maybe you're sitting here today and you realize how blessed you really are. And again, my, the, the, the point of this message is not to make you feel guilty. The point of this message is to, is to help you go, hey, look at how good God has been to me. How can I go and be good to others? And so maybe in your own heart, there's a little bit of a repentance piece that needs to come in where you maybe need to go, God, you know what? I haven't served my wife or I haven't served my kids or I haven't served my work uh, colleagues or I haven't done this or I haven't done that as well as I could. And maybe this is an opportunity to pray a simple prayer and say, Jesus, would you help me to put others first and to think of myself a little bit less? Not to think less of myself, but to think of myself less. Maybe you want to pray that prayer. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. We know that we all fall short, but yet you're so good, so kind, so merciful to every single one of us every single day. Help us to be grateful for your blessings and everything that you bestowed upon us. Help us to realize that the reason we have those things is not for our own uh, enjoyment alone, but also for the blessing of people around us and the world around us. 
Help us to make a difference in this nation, in, in Douglas County, in our schools, and everywhere we go, everywhere we set our feet. May people see the love of Jesus through the service of his people. We honor you for your goodness, your mercy, and for everyone that's sitting here today. Lord, thank you for this amazing church. So many generous, so many wonderful, amazing people sitting in front of me today. I'm so thankful for them. Pray you bless them and you bless their families. In Jesus' name, amen.